Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're gonna be finishing up section 11.10 from your textbook, which was our introduction into Taylor and McLaurin series. In the previous video, we went through and not only did we come up with a definition for a Taylor and McLaurin series, uh, we also saw how to build a McLaurin series for some very common sort of basic functions like e to the x, sine x, and cosine x. We also put that together with the work that we had done back in 11.9, where we had built power series representations based off the geometric series, and we had also manipulated that to come up with power series representations for the natural log function as well as the inverse tangent function. In this video, our focus is going to be no longer on looking at Maclaurin series, but at just getting a little bit of practice uh, building Taylor series centered at non-zero values. And when we do this, we're going to be really trying to build these from scratch because all those previous established series that we did, we built those six established series at the end of, at the end of our sort of first half of 11.10, all of those were Maclaurin series. They were all centered at x equals zero. And those are the most common sort of series to run into. But in this video, we'd like to spend just a little bit of time sort of practicing how do you build series centered at other values. And that's gonna give us some additional practice uh, using the definition of a Taylor series uh, to construct the actual series using that definition that the a sub n should be the nth derivative evaluated at the center divided by n factorial. So we'll sort of practice some of our sort of pattern recognition skills at building those Taylor series representations. So we'll do a couple examples of that and we'll have a little bit of a discussion in general how to get sort of better at that uh, pattern recognition that's necessary here. And then in the sort of very end of this, we'll talk just briefly about how we know these representations really actually are equivalent to the functions we're building them for. So let's get jump right in and take a look at a building a Taylor series centered at a non-zero value. So we're going to build a Taylor series centered at x equals 1 for this function f of x equals e to the negative 3x. First thing I'd like to call your attention to, of course, is that we are centering it at x equals 1, which is obviously a non-zero value. If we were building a Taylor series centered at x equals 0, or if we were building the Maclaurin series, however you want to phrase it, this question would be very easy. All we would do is do z equals negative 3x, then use the established series that we built uh, in sort of the middle of the previous video. That was for e to the x, centered at 0, and then we'd be all good. Unfortunately, though, here, because we want to center it at x equals 1, we don't have any established series centered at any non-zero values. And in fact, we won't because most of the standard established series are all centered at 0. So anytime you see something where it's centered at a non-zero value, you're always going to have to build that from scratch or via the definition. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we would do this. To start off with, we're going to make that little table. So we've got n, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Usually up to 4 is probably going to be sufficient to detect the pattern. If you're having trouble detecting the pattern, you can always do a few more, but you should always anticipate at least going probably 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, getting the first couple terms of the, the actual series. Then we need to make a column for the nth derivative of our function uh, at, in general. Now, of course, this is where we can put in our e to the minus 3x because that is our function that we're trying to come up with the Taylor series representation for. Then we'll need a column for those nth derivatives evaluated at the center. Then we'll need a column for those nth derivatives evaluated at the center divided by n factorial. These will be what we call the a sub n's. Those are going to be our sequence values. And then we'll need a final column for those sequence values times the actual polynomial piece, which is going to be x minus c to the n there. So that's what we'll need to sort of fill in. Once we get these, hopefully we can talk a little bit about how to determine a general pattern for them. So let's start by taking some derivatives here. So let's go ahead and take our first derivative, and we'll get minus 3e to the minus 3x. That's going to be via chain rule. Then we're going to take another derivative, and of course it's going to become positive, and we're going to get 3 times 3, which of course we all know is 9. But it might be a little bit easier, again, because of pattern recognition, instead of doing the arithmetic, to write it out a little bit more generally and just keep it as 3 squared. So when we take that second derivative, we'll write that as 3 squared e to the minus 3x. And again, the reason I'm doing that is because that's going to make it easier to do the pattern recognition. Nothing wrong with calling 3 squared 9, but it's going to sort of disguise the pattern that's going on. Always easier to sort of leave the arithmetic undone here. We'll take another derivative and get minus 3 cubed e to the minus 3x, and then one more derivative, and we'll get 3 to the fourth e to the minus 3x. 
Okay, so there's all our derivatives. Now we need to evaluate them at the center. So it looks like we're gonna get e to the minus three, negative three e to the minus three, three squared e to the minus three, negative three cubed e to the minus three, and three to the fourth e to the minus three. Then we're gonna take each of those and divide by n factorial, which is just gonna correspond here. So e to the minus three divided by zero factorial, then minus three e to the minus three divided by one factorial, then three squared e to the minus three divided by two factorial, minus three cubed e to the minus three divided by three factorial, and three to the fourth e to the minus three divided by four factorial. Could we do some arithmetic and maybe simplify some of these? Sure, probably these, three factorial and four factorial, we know that they have a factor of three in there, so we could do some cancellations. But again, that's not gonna make it any easier for defining the pattern. The pattern has to hold in general. So unless that was a simplification we could do sort of on every step, it's probably not a good idea to do it. Then here, we can go ahead and put in the final piece. So this one will be e to the minus three over zero factorial, because of course this one has x minus one to the zeroth, which is just one, so we don't need that. Then we'll have minus three e to the minus three over one factorial times x minus one. Then we'll have three squared e to the minus three over two factorial x minus one squared. Then negative three to the third e to the minus three over three factorial x minus one cubed. And then three to the fourth e to the minus three over four factorial x minus one to the fourth. So there's our terms there. Now we're ready to try to go ahead and write this out as a general pattern. So we can say e to the minus three x is equal to the summation from n equals zero to infinity. Let's try to take each piece bit by bit here. So the first thing we might notice is that we've got alternating components. It goes positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, then positive. So what is a good alternating piece? Something like minus one to the n. Now, since we're starting from n equals zero, minus one to the n will start positive, and that's exactly what we want. So we can start with a minus one to the n. If this guy started negative and then went positive, negative, positive, negative, then we might wanna use something like minus one to the n plus one. So when we plug in zero, we get a negative value. So got to think about whether or not you want to start positive or start negative, but overall the alternating piece will take care of the changing signs there. The next thing that we notice is that we've got sort of this three, three squared, three cubed, three to the fourth. Now there's no three here, but of course we can view a one as three to the zero. So we have three to the zero when n is zero, three to the one when n is one, three squared when n is two, three cubed when n is three, three to the fourth when n is four, should be pretty clear that we can represent that as three to the n. So that will take care of what's here, what's here, 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 and here. Okay, next thing we see is that we always have e to the minus three. Notice that that e to the minus three never changes, so it shouldn't have an n, it doesn't depend on the index, we just need to include it. So we'll go ahead and just take this piece here, this e to the minus three. Okay, that e to the minus three, we can just write as e to the minus three. No n, because it doesn't depend on the index. Next piece that we see here, we've got the zero factorial, one factorial, two factorial, three factorial, four factorial. Notice that that factorial directly corresponds with the index. So we can put that as divided by n factorial. Then, Last piece, we can think about this as x minus one to the zero. So if we look at those pieces here, sort of this, 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 and this, we can view that as x minus one to the n. And there we go. We've now represented every piece that we're seeing here in our general pattern. Let's rewrite this, see if there's any simplifications, or, and if not, we can call it good and then move on to the radius of convergence. So we're saying e to the minus three x should be equivalent to the sum from n equals zero to infinity, minus one to the n, looks like three n e to the minus three over n factorial, x minus one to the n. 
and there we go. We don't see any simplifications. This factorial in general isn't going to cancel with any of those things. Uh, we should be all good there. Obviously, we could combine these and call it minus 3 to the n. But again, we usually like to have the alternating piece sort of pulled out separately. This is all good. Now, we don't know where this equality holds. It might hold only on a finite interval, a finite radius of convergence, or maybe it holds everywhere. We probably have a guess. We see this n factorial down here. If I choose an x value, this will be exponential. This is exponential. This is just alternating, and this is a constant. So everything up top is exponential. We know the factorial is a level faster. So we're probably expecting that this converges everywhere. To actually test that, though, we need to do ratio test. So to determine radius of convergence, we'll use ratio test. We're choosing to use ratio test, of course, because we do have a factorial present. So we'll need to do the limit as n goes to infinity. Absolute value, we'll plug in n plus 1, so minus 1 to the n plus 1, 3 to the n plus 1, e to the minus 3, over n plus 1 factorial, x minus 1 to the n plus 1, and then the nth term, 8 is a bend down here, so minus 1 to the n, 3 to the n, e to the minus 3, over n factorial, x minus 1 to the n. The only things that are going to move is this will swing up and this will swing down. So let's rewrite that real quick. Close up the absolute value. Limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value, minus 1 to the n plus 1, 3 to the n plus 1, e to the minus 3, n factorial, x minus 1 to the n plus 1, scoot that down just a little bit there, divided by minus 1 to the n, 3 to the n, e to the minus 3, n plus 1 factorial, x minus 1 to the n, will close up our absolute value. Okay, let's grab this before we start doing our simplifications. And we'll just grab that around there. Should be all good. Okay, let's take that onto the next page and simplify it. We probably can see some simplifications already. All right, first thing we can do is we can just ignore these because we know the absolute value when they apply is not gonna matter. And then we can simplify the other things. So we get the limit as n goes to infinity. This is going to cancel with this. So it looks like we should get a three. This will cancel with this. So that'll just drop out entirely. n factorial will cancel with n plus one factorial. And then the denominator will get n plus one. And x minus 1 to the n and x to the minus 1 to the n plus 1 will leave us an x minus 1 here. Okay, we now know that this absolute value really only impacts the x here because 3 over n plus 1 is going to be always positive. So we have this as the limit as n goes to infinity, 3 over n plus 1, absolute value x minus 1. Since remember our center is at 1, we want to have this sort of expression where we're measuring x from the center. Now, of course, this doesn't have an n, so we can stick it in front. x minus 1, limit n goes to infinity, 3 over n plus 1. And, of course, that is x minus 1 in absolute value times 0. Because as n goes to infinity, this limit goes to 0. All right, remember, we're doing this to figure out the radius of convergence. So we want this to converge. So to converge, we need this to come in less than 1. So we need absolute value x minus 1 times 0 to be less than 1. Of course, because this limit came in as 0, this is going to be always true. So that means our radius of convergence is positive infinity. So that means the result we established, e to the negative 3x, is equivalent to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n, 3 to the n, e to the minus 3, over n factorial, x minus 1 to the n, for all x, or absolute value of x less than infinity. So there we go. We've built our first example of a Taylor series centered at a non-zero value. In this case, we centered it at x equals 1. We got sort of a messier expression in here because of that, but there we go. We went ahead and did this from the definition based on this sort of table here, then looking at what we were seeing in that sort of pattern, describing each piece. We didn't see any simplification, so every piece just sort of remained as we sort of saw it, and that gave us our Taylor series centered at x equals 1. Okay, let's immediately jump in and take a look at sort of another example of that. 
So we're going to build a Taylor series centered at x equals negative 3 for the function f of x equals 1 over x squared. And then again, we'll determine its radius of convergence. So again, we have a non-zero center, so x equals minus 3, which means we're going to need to do this based on the definition. Before we do that, though, one quick comment I'd like to make about the radius of convergence. We might not know the radius of convergence uh, exactly, but we do know its maximum value. Remember, we talked about how the maximum radius of convergence is going to be limited by the distance to the first discontinuity. Well, this thing we know is discontinuous at x equals 0. And since we are center, is going to be at negative 3. Negative 3 to 0 is 3 units. So we know that the radius of convergence can be no more than 3. Does that mean it is exactly 3? Not necessarily. We don't know that here, but we know that it can't be any larger than 3. So let's go ahead and actually build the Taylor series, and then we can investigate its radius of convergence. So same as before, let's make our table. So we'll have our n, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We'll have those nth derivatives. And again, we'll be putting our function right here. Probably a good idea to use the negative exponent since we're going to have to take derivatives of it, so x to the minus 2. Then those derivatives evaluated at the center. Then those derivatives evaluated at the center divided by n factorial. And then those derivatives evaluated at the center divided by n factorial times x minus the center to the n. Okay, let's go ahead and fill in these derivatives first. So first derivative here would be negative 2x to the negative 3. Next time I drop this down, it'll become positive. It would become 6, but I'm going to just write it as 3 times 2. So we'll do it as 3 times 2, x to the minus 4. Again, want to avoid doing that arithmetic. We sort of want to see the pattern here. Let's take another one, and we would get negative 4 times 3 times 2 times x to the minus 5. This should start to feel like a familiar pattern. This looks very factorial in nature. Now let's drop down that negative 5. So we would get 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times x to the minus 6. Okay, let's evaluate those at the center, which is negative 3. So we're going to get negative 3 to the negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 3 to the negative 3. 3 times 2 times negative 3 to the negative 4. Negative 4 times 3 times 2 times negative 3 to the negative 5. 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times negative 3 to the negative 6. Again, maybe we could do some things with that, but we'll leave it for now. Then we'll put the n factorial on each of those. So minus 3 to the minus 2, 0 factorial. Minus 2 to minus 3 to the minus 3 over 1 factorial. 3 times 2 times minus 3 to the minus 4 over 2 factorial minus 4 times 3 times 2 minus 3 to the minus 5 over 3 factorial, and then 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times minus 3 to the minus 6 divided by 4 factorial. Now, right here we have an option. If you think about it, we've got something that sort of seems factorial in nature here and something that's factorial in nature here. We might be able to cancel those. And in fact, we might be able to find cancellations that sort of work across the board. You're welcome to do that now, or you can sort of do that later on. It doesn't matter how you want to approach it. If you wanted to simplify it, you might want to give yourself some more space to sort of do some simplifications and see. There might be a way to sort of cancel this factorial with this one every time. You can investigate that now, or the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to sort of wait until I have it all written out and then try to see in general how I can simplify it. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and just write out my next column. So when n is 0, we're not going to have any sort of polynomial term. So we'll just have minus 3 to the minus 2 divided by 0 factorial. Then minus 2 minus 3 to the minus 3 over 1 factorial. Then 3 times 2 times minus 3 to the minus 4 over 2 factorial. Then minus 4 times 3 times 2 times minus 3 to the minus 5 over 3 factorial. And then 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times minus 3 to the minus 6 over 4 factorial. Okay, and then we'll just add in our x. This guy doesn't get anything there, excuse me. So this is x plus 3. This is x plus 3 squared. x plus 3 cubed and x plus 3 to the fourth. And of course, that's because we're doing x minus c, and our center is negative 3. So negative negative 3 gives us those plus 3s in here. OK, 
Okay, let's see if we can talk about what each piece of this looks like. So we're saying one over x squared should be equal to the summation, n equals zero to infinity. All right, first thing we notice, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. All right, that means we have an alternating component, so something to take care of here. All right, again, it starts positive. We're starting from n equals zero, so we can go ahead and use minus one to the n. Okay, next thing we're seeing here is I'm seeing this minus three component. So let's go ahead and figure out how we would write that out. So it's gonna be minus three to an exponent. And of course that exponent is changing. So how is that exponent phrased in terms of the index? Well, negative two with zero, negative three with one, negative four with two, negative five with three, negative six with four. So that sounds like it's two ahead. This is six and this is four, this is five, this is three, this is four, this is two, yep. This power is always two ahead of the index and it's negative. So that sounds like we should have minus three to the negative n plus two. Okay, that sounds good. Now let's go ahead and talk about this piece here. We've got this two, then three times two, then four times three times two, then five times four times three times two. Those are definitely factorials. We could always put in a one on each of these. So the missing one is not a big deal. Notice that the sort of lead value is always one ahead of the index. So we can do n plus one factorial. Okay, next thing we've got is this factorial, which should be nice and easy. It directly corresponds to that there. So we can do this and this, 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 and this. So we'd say divided by n factorial. Notice now we can easily see that we're gonna be able to cancel that out, but we can do that at the end. And then finally, we've got this guy right here, which is this, 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 this. I guess technically there's sort of a missing one there, but that's x plus three to the zero. So x plus three to the n. So there's our expression for this, for the Taylor series of this expression centered at negative three. Okay, let's rewrite this a little bit and see what we can do to simplify it. So we can say one over x squared is the summation from n equals zero to infinity. Let's uh, swing this down into the denominator and put everything else sort of into the numerator there. So minus one to the n, looks like n plus one factorial ends up in the numerator. And then looks like we get minus three to the n plus two in the denominator, n factorial and x plus three to the n. Now, we could call it good here, but there is definitely some simplifications. First one, cancel that n factorial with the n plus one factorial. So we should be able to get one over x squared is the sum from n equals zero to infinity, minus one to the n, n plus one over minus three to the n plus two, x plus three to the n. Then of course this, remember this minus three can be minus one times three, so we can break that up into a couple components. One over x squared, sum n equals zero to infinity, minus one to the n, n plus one. Looks like we should get minus one to the n plus two, and three to the n plus two, uh, x plus three to the n. Okay, now notice I could cancel this with this, and I just get minus one squared in the denominator. But what's minus one squared? Well, it's just positive one. So in other words, these just completely drop out as being equivalent to one. So we have one over x squared is the sum from n equals zero to infinity, n plus one over three n plus two times x plus three to the n. That's our simplest expression. Now, we got a lot of cancellations there. Let's go take a quick look back and see if these make sense. The first thing you should notice is that it's no longer alternating. It's sort of claiming that this thing is always positive. And if we go back and check, right, minus three to the minus two, sure, that's in the denominator, but it's squaring a negative. That's gonna make it positive. Here, negative three to the negative three, that's cubing a negative, that'll be negative, but we have a negative, so it'll be positive. This is minus three to the minus four. That's taking the fourth power of a negative. That'll be positive. 
negative three to the negative five, that's taking an odd exponent of a negative. That'll be negative, but we have a negative. That'll be positive. So yeah, all of these are actually positive. So even though we didn't immediately see that, once we simplified it, it's always positive here. Also notice that if we did go ahead and just cancel back here, well, that two factorial would have taken out that, three factorial would have taken out that, four factorial would have taken all that. So only this value was there, which is just one ahead of our index. So again, you can sort of simplify and then try to get the pattern or get the pattern and then try to simplify. Doesn't matter as long as you do get to that sort of simplest form at the end there. Okay, now we'd like to go ahead and figure out that radius of convergence for this. Remember, we're sort of expecting something around three or less than three in terms of the radius of convergence. So let's just copy that and we'll go on to our next page here. All right, so we've got that. Now we wanna do our radius of convergence. So uh, we could use ratio test, we could use root test. The issue, of course, with root test is that when we raise this to the one over n, we're gonna get this sort of awkward n plus one to the one over n, and this doesn't distribute very well over addition, so it might, again, be easier to use ratio. If we just had n over three n plus two, it might be easy to use root test, but I'll just go ahead and use ratio here. So we'll use ratio test. So we'll take the limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value, we'll plug in n plus one. So it looks like we're going to get n plus one plus one over three, n plus one plus two, and then x plus three to the n plus one divided. Then we just have the n plus one over three to the n plus two, x plus three to the n. Once again, just this piece and this piece will swing around. So we can rewrite this as the limit as n goes to infinity. And we'll simplify a little bit. n plus one plus one, that's of course just n plus two. Three to the n plus two and x plus three to the n plus one. And then down here, we've got our n plus one. We've got three n plus one plus two. So that sounds like three to the n plus three. And we also have x plus three to the n. All right, let's do some simplifications. This will cancel with this, and it looks like we'll just have a three to the one left over, and this will cancel with this, and we'll just have an x plus three in the numerator. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity in absolute value, n plus two times x plus three over n plus one times three. Now let's realize that this, this, and this are all positive, so the absolute value is just going to apply to that part. So we can view this as the limit as n goes to infinity, n plus two over, if we multiply this out, I guess we get what, three n plus three, and then absolute value x plus three. Okay, this is measuring x from the center, so this is perfect. Let's go stick this outside though. So this is absolute value x plus three, limit, n goes to infinity, n plus two over three n plus three. At this point, we should be very comfortable with this sort of limit, one over n, one over n, that's gonna to go to one third there. So we get absolute value x plus three times one third. Now to converge, what do we need? Well, we need absolute value x plus three times this limit of one third to come in less than one. Multiplying this over, we get x plus three less than three. So this tells us at max, we can go three units from our center. So this tells us our radius convergence is three, as predicted by testing to the first, for the distance to the first discontinuity. So the radius of convergence is three here. Summarizing all this, we can say that one over x squared is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity our simplified version was, yep, n plus one over three to the n plus two times x plus three to the n. And that holds as long as the absolute value 
of x plus 3 is less than 3. So if you think about that, that's saying that we're really operating on the interval negative 6 to 0. Now, we did not do interval of convergence, and to be honest, we're not going to be that interested in interval of convergence here, so we don't know what happens at negative 6 and 0. You could plug those in and test them. In this case, they actually would both diverge, so this is actually an interval of convergence like this. But again, that's not going to be too interesting to us. We're more interested in just radius of convergence and the actual series expansion. Okay, great. So we developed another Taylor series centered at a non-zero value, uh, this time for 1 over x squared centered at negative 3. Let's do a quick follow-up th to this before we get to our last example. Let's see if we can use our sort of old manipulations, but on something that looks like this. So we want to use the previous example to build a Taylor series centered at x equals negative 3, so same place, for g of x equals x plus 3 over x squared. And then we're going to just state its radius of convergence. So we just figured out that 1 over x squared is equivalent to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. Uh, we found... Up, up top n plus 1 over 3 to the n plus 2 times that x plus 3 to the n as long as absolute value x is less than 3 or absolute value x plus 3 is less than 3. So this is what we just did. We'd like to build one for x plus 3 over x squared. Are we allowed to multiply both sides by x plus 3? Well, this is why we're doing this example. In the past, we always were multiplying by things like x or x squared, and we said that you got to make sure you multiply by the right type of polynomial. Remember that the actual manipulation is that you can multiply both sides by a polynomial with the same center. The center here is negative 3, or x plus 3 is a polynomial term, and that's exactly what we want to multiply by. So in this case, because we built one centered at x equals negative 3, we can multiply both sides by x plus 3. Could we do this and multiply both sides by like x? No, because with this, we cannot multiply an x into here because the center here is negative 3. But we can multiply both sides by x plus 3. So we can say x plus 3 over x squared is x plus 3 times the summation from n equals 0 to infinity, n plus 1 over 3 to the n plus 2, x plus 3 to the n. And again, remember, multiplying by a polynomial term does not impact radius of convergence. So uh, this is going to have the same radius here. This guy distributes in, boosts this power up by 1. Let's close up that parentheses there. So we can say x plus 3 over x squared is actually equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, n plus 1 over 3, n plus, 3 to the n plus 2, x plus 3 to the n plus 1, as long as, again, we're on x plus 3 in absolute value, less than 3. So just a quick follow-up to make sure you guys see that even when we're working with Taylor series centered at other non-zero values, you still have those same manipulations. You can still multiply by a polynomial as long as it has the same center. Could still differentiate and integrate. Could still substitute. Again, as long as you were substituting something that has the same center here. Okay, let's do one last example of building one of these Taylor series centered at a non-zero value. So for our last one, we're going to build a Taylor series centered at x equals 3 pi over 4 for f of x equals sine 2x. And then we're going to determine its radius of convergence. So same idea. Let's make our little table, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We'll look at the derivatives along the way here. And of course, our first one is sine 2x. So we can put that in. Then we'll be evaluating those derivatives at the center then evaluating the derivatives at the center divided by n factorial, and then looking at the derivatives evaluated at the center divided by n factorial, x minus the center to the n. Okay, just as standard here. So here is our center, and there, of course, is our function. So let's take our first derivative here. So if we take our first derivative, we're going to get 2 cosine 2x by chain rule. We take another derivative, and we're going to get negative 2 squared. Again, it's going to be 4, but we should view it sort of in a pattern-based way. Sine 2x. Derivative again, we'll get negative 2 cubed cosine 2x. Derivative again, we'll get 2 to the fourth sine 2x. Okay, let's evaluate these at the center. Since we're going to be evaluating at 3 pi over 4, when 3 pi over 4 goes in there, 
it's going to be 2 times 3 pi over 4 is the argument. That's going to give us 3 pi over 2. So we're evaluating each of these trig functions at 3 pi over 2. Keep in mind at 3 pi over 2, sine is negative 1 and cosine is 0. So this is going to be negative 1, 0. This is going to be 2 squared. This is going to be 0. And this is going to be negative 2 to the fourth. So there we go. Now we can go ahead and get these n factorial. So this is going to be minus 1 over 0 factorial. This is going to be 0. This is going to be 2 squared over 2 factorial. This is going to be 0. And this is going to be minus 2 to the fourth over 4 factorial. Then we can put these terms together. So we have minus 1 over 0 factorial times, and of course, this is x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 0, so that's still just constant, then 0. 2 squared over 2 factorial, x minus 3 pi over 4 squared, then 0, and then minus 2 to the 4th over 4 factorial, x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 4th. Okay, so there's our terms. Now notice half of these terms are going to come out as zero. Every other one is going to be zero here. So we're going to have to make use of that as we do this. So let's go ahead and think about how we can actually write this out. So we can say sine of 2x is the summation from n equals zero to infinity. Okay, first thing we'd like to know is negative, positive, negative. So once again, it is alternating here. So we're going to have to make so to do with that, now this time it starts negative. Since we're starting from n equals 0, we need to use something like minus 1 to the n. That'll start positive. So if we do minus 1 to the n plus 1, well, n equals 0, minus 1 to the 1, that will be negative. So we can start with that. Next thing we have is we've got this 2 to the 0, 2 squared, and 2 to the 4th. So what we should notice there right, is that it's matching this index, but it's only got the even ones. So how do we represent even numbers? Well, we can represent those as 2n. So this, this, and this, we will need to represent that as 2 to the 2n. Now, this is one thing where our, just our use of n as our standard index can sort of trip us up. This n that we're writing here is different than this n. This n here is actually, for this one, it's n equals 0. This is little n equals 1. This is n equals 2. And then what we're doing there is we're saying as this n goes 0, 1, 2, 3, it's hitting this, then this, then this, because we want to skip all of those odd terms. So this is just sort of an issue, the fact that we like to use n as our index, but this n here is not the same as this n here. So this n when it's zero is this, this n when it's one is this, and this n when it's two is this. So this is a, you just gotta be comfortable with the fact that it's, a, it's the same letter, but really a different index. Notice that down here, we have the exact same thing, except it's the factorial. So we can phrase this in the same way. So this can be divided by two n factorial. There we go, same idea, that these correspond to double these, so we're using the even ones. And same thing with this, notice that these exponents correspond, so we can phrase this thing right here, and technically this guy here, as x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 2n. So notice that all the ones that were just showing up with even numbers, these powers of 2, the factorial down here, and the powers of x minus 3 pi over 4, those all got the even. Would you ever put the even on this? Well, no, because then minus 1 to the 2n would always just be positive 1. It wouldn't really be alternating. So this takes care of that alternating piece, and then these even components make sure that we only hit the even values there. All right, there we go. There's our expression for sine 2x centered at negative, or at centered at 3 pi over 4. Let's just rewrite it and see if there's anything to simplify. Well, here we have n equals 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the n plus 1, 2 to the 2n, 2n factorial, 
x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 2n. Not much you can really do with this because there aren't several exponentials or anything that you could simplify. This isn't minus two to the two n, so we can't bring out a minus one maybe to cancel with that. This is about as good as this guy gets here. Do we have a guess for the radius of convergence for this? Well, once again, once you choose an x value, this is exponential, this is exponential, this is just alternating, there's a factorial. This thing should have an infinite radius of convergence. Let's just go ahead and check that. So radius of convergence. We will use ratio test. We have to because we have a factorial there. So let's go ahead and take a look. It'll be the limit as n goes to infinity. Plug in the n plus one, so minus one to the n plus one plus one. Two to the two times n plus one over two times n plus one factorial. X minus three pi over four to the two times n plus one. Then divide all that, plug in the normal n, so minus 1 to the n plus 1, 2 to the 2n, 2n factorial, x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 2n. Okay, we'll close up our absolute value. Okay, uh, do we have enough room to squeeze this in here? Yeah, I think we can do one more line, limit n goes to infinity. Okay. Absolute value means that these alternating pieces, we can just forget that. We'll swing this guy up and we'll swing this guy down. So we have absolute value, two to the two n plus one. That sounds like we're gonna have two to the two n plus two. Swing this guy up means that we also have a two n factorial. And of course we still have this term, which is x minus three pi over four parentheses to the two n plus two. Then divided by down here in the denominator, we've got our two to the two n still, so two to the two n. We swung this thing down, so it looks like we have two n plus two factorial. And then of course we have this guy as well, so x minus three pi over four to the two n, close up our absolute value. Okay, we'll grab all this stuff. Okay, we'll copy that. Move on to one more page for this guy. Okay, expand that just a little bit. Okay, some simplifications, pretty common ones. We can cancel this with this. We'll just have a two squared. Uh, we can cancel this 2n plus 2 factor with 2n. That's gonna leave us a 2n plus 2 as well as a 2n plus 1 in the denominator. So limit n goes to infinity, two to the two up top. This cancels with this, so we get x minus three pi over four squared, then divided down here, cancel this with this. Like we said, that's gonna leave us with the two n plus two, as well as with the two n plus one. Okay, now all this stuff is positive. Absolute value is only going to apply to this term. So we can view this as the limit as n goes to infinity, two squared over two n plus two, two n plus one, absolute value, parentheses x minus three pi over four squared. Well, now it should be very clear, this limit, this is a number over something that just gets larger and larger. This is gonna be zero times the absolute value, x minus Oh, well, I guess we're skipping our step there. My apologies, let's go ahead. Swing this guy in front as we normally do. So x minus three pi over four squared in absolute value times the limit as n goes to infinity of two squared over two n plus two times two n plus one. Sort of gave it away, but this is of course gonna go to zero. So we have absolute value x minus three pi over four squared times zero. That's what we got there. To converge, we need this to come in less than one. So we need absolute value, x minus three pi over four squared times zero to come in less than one. Well, this is always true. So that tells us our radius convergence is positive infinity. So what we just figured out is that sine of 2x is equivalent to the sum 
from n equals 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the n plus 1. Uh, what do we find as our expression there? 2 to the 2n over 2n factorial x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 2n for all x. So there is an expansion for sine centered not at 0, but at 3 pi over 4. Now, notice you might say, well, this seems very sort of strange after we did this here. Uh, we got something very different when we did sine of x and we did its Maclaurin series. We got all odd exponents, and we said that that made sense because it was an odd function, so it had to have all odd exponents. Well, yeah, because we were doing it centered at 0, and 0 is where that odd even symmetry is defined. Now we're centering at 3 pi over 4, and we'd have to look at the symmetry based around x equals 3 pi over 4. And actually, if you look at it based on x equals 3 pi over 4, this sine 2x function, well, sine 2x, if you actually look at, you know, say this is 3 pi over 4, sine 2x is right here. It's actually at its trough. And if you divide it there, actually what's on this side is directly symmetric to this. So it's even relevant to 3 pi over 4, which is why you got all even exponents here. Now, that's very counterintuitive to our standard geometry, because when we standardly think of geometry, we think about around x equals 0, which is why most people use the Maclaurin series. But just because we want to be able to sort of have a full understanding of this, we've now done three examples of building these Taylor series centered at non-zero values. Let's do one quick follow-up of this and then wrap up what we've been talking about here. So as a quick follow-up, let's use the previous example to build a Taylor series centered at x equals 3 pi over 4 for cosine 2x, and then we'll state its radius of convergence. So let's go back and just grab what we just got here, because we're trying to use this. So we've got this guy here. Okay. So if we do this here, do we need to sort of redo that whole table approach? Hopefully not. What we can instead do... Let's go ahead and paste that in here. There we go. So what can we do with this then? Well, we don't need to redo the whole table. We know we can just differentiate this. So let's differentiate both sides here. And we'll differentiate sine 2x prime, and that'll be equivalent to differentiating over here, minus one to the n plus one, two to the two n, two n factorial, x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 2n, all differentiated. And of course, that doesn't impact the radius of convergence. If we differentiate here, we're going to get 2 cosine 2x. So that'll be close, but of course, we can just divide the 2 over later. When we differentiate over here, we'll have our sum. We might lose the first term, so let's be cautious here. Everything else is, all these are going to be constants, so we'll just leave this here. n plus 1, 2 to the 2n, 2n factorial. Differentiating here, we drop the 2n down, so we have times 2n. And then x minus 3 pi over 4. We subtract 1 from that exponent. Now we have 2n minus 1. So we value x less than infinity. Does it still make sense to have n equals 0 here? Well, n equals 0 would give us a negative exponent, so not really. So we're going to need to have that start from n equals 1 now. Any simplifications we can do? Well, this 2n factorial, of course, has 2n, then times 2n minus 1, then times 2n minus 2, times dot, dot, dot. The 2n and the 2n can cancel, and we'll have a 2n minus 1 factorial. So it looks like we have 2 cosine 2x is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n plus 1, 2 to the 2n over 2n minus 1 factorial after canceling this with this. And then we have x minus 3 pi over 4 to the 2n minus 1, as long as the absolute value of x is less than infinity. All right, last thing we can do is we can divide the 2 over. When we get that one half here, it'll move it and cancel with one of those exponents. So we should be able to see that cosine 2x is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n plus 1, 2 to the 2n minus 1, 2n minus 1 factorial, x minus 3 pi over 4 
two n minus one, as long as absolute value of x is less than infinity. So there we go. Without having to use the definition, we used our previous one, differentiated it, which is totally fine to do. We know that you can differentiate and integrate power series term by term. So we did that here. And now we have an expression for cosine two x centered at three pi over four. If you want to, you can try re-indexing this. Instead of starting at n equals one, you can do k equals n minus one, so that then you can start at k equals zero and go through and re redo all that to see what they look like. You'll find that these things will actually become like 2k plus ones then. That's fine, but again, we don't have any rule that we have to start at n equals zero. We just do it out of convenience. But of course, under differentiation, we often lose that first term. That's why we now have a one starting at n equals one. Again, that's just convention. Totally fine to have it started at n equals one here. All right, before we wrap this up, let's go ahead and just quickly summarize some of the things we've seen for how we detect these patterns here. So. This is just a couple tips for building Taylor series from definition, i.e. from scratch. Remember, we do this when you have a non-zero center. If you run into something where you want the McLaurin series or the Taylor series centered at zero, you should just use the six established series we already have and manipulate them. The only time you really need to worry about using the definition is when you're trying to build it from scratch when it's centered at a non-zero value. So keep in mind alternating terms, they're represented with minus one to the n if they start positive, minus one to the n plus one if they start negative. That's something we use several times. Only even values are represented with two n, while only odd values are represented with two n plus one. We use that on the last one. And of course, do not simplify unless the simplification applies the same way for every n value. Another way of putting this is don't simplify until you have everything written into the general format, and then you can go ahead and see if you can simplify. Just as a quick note for comments one and two here, do keep in mind that these hold only if you start your series from n equals zero. If you try starting it from n equals one, well then this would actually start negative, this would actually start positive, so you'd have to sort of modify that. Then you'd also probably wanna use like 2n minus one to represent the always odd values. But again, we generally just make things more consistent, always try to start our series from n equals zero. So these are just a couple little tips summarizing the last couple examples. All right, to finish up 11.10 then, the last thing I just wanna mention is a brief comment on how we know these power series actually match the functions we're building them for. And this is gonna be our segue to our very last section in chapter 11, which is section 11.11. .11. So let's talk about it really briefly. So how do we know these power series representations really exist? I mean, we're building them, but remember this computational approach we, we came up with it assumed that the things we're building exist and then said, if they exist, then they must match these Taylor and McLaurin series that we're building. So all of this rests on the assumption that they exist. So to understand why these representations work, we need just two brief definitions. And this first definition right here is something we're gonna use a lot in our next section. So let's let f of x be a function that we're trying to build a Taylor series for. We call the Taylor polynomial of degree k centered at x equals c, the finite series, so not the infinite series, the finite series, or just the polynomial, t sub k of x equals the sum n equals zero to k, a sub n, x minus c to the n, where those a sub n's are still the f n at c divided by n factor, the same ones. So in other words, you can think about the Taylor polynomial as the truncated version of the Taylor series. It only runs the series out to some finite value k. And you can see why we call it the k degree k. The last one is gonna be x minus c to the k, so it's gonna be degree k as a polynomial. Then we also define the kth degree remainder term of a Taylor series centered at x equals c is given by r sub k, where you take the function you're trying to represent and you subtract that Taylor polynomial. So the Taylor polynomial is a finite estimate of our function, and the remainder function is the difference between our function and that finite polynomial that's estimating it. It should be of no doubt then, this theorem right here, that says f of x is equal to its Taylor series centered at x equals c on some interval, if for all x in that interval, the limit of that remainder function equals zero. Now, this is a nice and easy theorem, but the reason we're not gonna do too much with this is that while it looks nice and easy, it's actually a much deeper statement 
than it might sort of initially appear. This limit here is a limit of these remainder functions. And when we say it's equal to zero, we don't mean that it's equal to the number zero. We mean that this function is equal to the function zero, the function that no matter what you input, you always get an output of zero. So this is actually a totally new sort of limit for you guys. This is actually what would be called a functional limit. It's not a limit of, uh, of values, it's a limit of functions. And we're saying that the remainder function becomes the zero function in the long run. Now again, that's a little beyond the scope of our class, so we're just gonna be stating this, and we won't be doing too much in terms of proving anything with it, but I wanted you guys just to see this definition. So in other words, these Taylor series really match the function that we've been building them for, provided these remainder functions in the long run become the zero function. It turns out for all the ones that we've built, that is absolutely the case. How do you actually prove this remainder theorem or this remainder function goes to zero? Well, there's a very useful follow-up theorem and we're gonna explore this thing a lot more in 11.11. .11. This is sometimes referenced as Taylor's inequality and it basically bounds the size of these remainder functions. What it says is if you can find a bound for the k plus first derivative, so in other words, the next derivative of our function, and you can find a bound for that, an upper bound. This should feel sort of similar to those uh, integration bound formulas, those error bound formulas. So if you can find a bound for the k plus first derivative on the interval you're working in, then the remainder function is bounded by that bound divided by k plus one factorial times x minus the center to the k plus one. So in other words, it's bounded by that bound for the derivative divided by the k plus one factorial times the distance you are from your center to the k plus one power. Now, your textbook does a couple examples of actually proving formally that things like e to the x or sine of x really do match their power series representations. Feel free to read those. They're definitely interesting proofs, but we will not be focusing on proving that functions are equivalent to their power series. I want you guys to feel comfortable building both McLaurin series and Taylor series, but you don't need to worry about proving that the representation equates to the actual function. Instead, what we're gonna mostly do to finish up this chapter 11 is use this Taylor's inequality, this bounding of the remainder function, to get an idea of the accuracy of estimating using polynomial functions. So in other words, in our last sort of video, our video for 11.11, .11, we're gonna take a look at coming up with some error bound formulas for these Taylor polynomials. So. We'll take a look at this theorem in a bit more depth in our next video. All that you should really keep in mind from this is this definition of the Taylor polynomial, that it's a sort of the finite version of your Taylor series. You just cut it off at some point. And in general, that we'll be getting a good way to bound how accurate those Taylor polynomials are at estimating the overall function.